Um, let's uh, start with any questions related to lab, like we typically do. Um, just to kind of re review what we talked about Tuesday um, with the micro lab quiz, I was going to have available to you in Blackboard. Uh, and I had chosen nine to 12, that three hour span. Is that pose a problem for anybody? No. Okay, <clears throat> I will assume then that that time works. This is for Tuesday the 21st, right? Okay, any, any questions on that? I don't think so. Have you looked at the videos that I placed in the in Blackboard re regarding the exercises that we were going to do this week? That was the alcohol. No, I didn't. Look, I didn't look at it yet. Okay. Everybody, look at those. Everybody's head should be saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, I did that." Okay, well, make sure you look at those. All right, any, anything on lab stuff? Okay, um, how about lecture, chapter 12, uh, we're scheduled to be doing this week. I um, did go in this morning and I, I looked that over. Um, I always do look my PowerPoints over before class and I made very minor edits. And when I say minor, I mean like added a word to a bulleted section that I thought might even make it more clear, a minor little stuff. So don't, I'm not saying you have to go back and print all that off or anything like that. But um, I made a couple of tweaks, not, not significant. So uh, questions on on 12. Uh, just to, now for our next exam, is it gonna, cause I know we're gonna talk about what we talk about in accordance with the chapter that we're working on right now, but is the next exam gonna be geared more towards, um, I can't think of the professor's name online, what his lecture is? Um. No, I wouldn't say necessarily, uh, but as you found, having watched that, um, he, for the most part, covers the same information, the same slides as I would. Um, so if he makes a comment, which I know he did with regard to, um, you know, 90% of antimicrobials are targeting the cell wall uh, mm -hmm. formation and or protein synthesis, that's not something that I'm going to put on the test. But I think he does bring up some interesting material that, that I might not have and vice versa. But um, I would use um, my slides as a sort of a major template. Okay. I, I hope that doesn't make it more confusing for you. The other thing you could do actually, and I, and I was doing this too, is I was... I was listening to him and I was looking at my PowerPoint slides because I was mm -hmm. kind of concerned as to was he covering enough material adequately for, for me to say to you guys, check it out. And I think the answer, answer there was yes. So you're going to see okay. the m majority of the slides he's using are the same as mine, although it is coming, I think, from the ninth edition versus the 10th. So it might be a gray background versus a blue, you know what I'm saying? To the, yeah, there was some little bit of differences when he was going over it. A few minor differences, right? But um, nothing that should really be significant. So to answer your question, um, I would definitely listen to those, um, but I would focus on the PowerPoint slides that I posted okay. in the course shell. Because I listened to, like you said, I listened to his lecture, but I also made notations and looked on with what we had. How did that work? Um, it was, it was okay. It's, 
different, very different, of course, but I mean, it was, it was tolerable. It made, it helped make it make sense. Well, that was the hope. <laughs> Um, I think I put more effort into my slides than he has, and I'm not saying that to brag or anything, you do. But, but, but there's a lot no, more you do. time. And, and I, think, I think they're better slides, but I don't think his are horrible. He, he's just pretty much taken what the text author uh, publisher provides, and he's thrown those in. Not that mine haven't been construction, constructed in a similar sort of way, but I've, I've added and I've tried to expand and improve the slides. Um, so. Yeah, I do like your lecture better. Just, just FYI. <laughs> yeah, you're used to me more than him, I think. Yeah, very much so. Um, maybe what we could do, and I, I again, I'm, I'm opening the floor for questions. So if, if you're not going to ask questions, I'll just maybe have us kind of walk through the chapter from beginning to end yeah. and, and you can just say, hey, yeah. can you explain this or whatever? Yeah, that sounds okay. good. Okay, let's do that. So, uh, in fact, let me pull up the PowerPoint here, which you probably have in front of you. I hope you do. Um, so just give me a second here. By the way, has anybody watched that YouTube video on uh, the, a deep look into the biology and evolution of COVID-19 done by the University of California folks? Not, a watch Not yet. Okay, I, I've been watching snippets of it. I haven't watched the entire thing at once because it is an hour and 25 minutes long. But, yeah. but, I, but I will tell you that I think the first 45 minutes are going to be the best probably for you to watch. Not to say that the remaining uh, hour is not good, but but I was, in the last part of the video, they're, they're throwing out questions. The, the moderator of this talk, who is the professor emeritus there in the Department of Biology, he's throwing out stuff and then the other three faculty members are kind of commenting on it, which is a nice format to have. But I thought that the presentations that they gave at the beginning were most informative, and I think um, you'll get the most out of. Just FYI. Um, so I would, again, request that you watch at least the first 45 minutes of that. Okay. It's it's going to be something I think you'll find interesting, and. Um, you'll be more inform informed as to what's going on with that virus too. Okay. So I need to go to the lecture course show here. I posted it in both the lecture and the lab course shows. And I've even um, posted it in my ANP uh, website too, the Blackboard website. You guys will have a much better time understanding it than than the other students because we've talked about viruses, obviously. For some reason, our internet has been uh, acting up just a little bit today. I don't know why. Has anybody else had any perceived? Yeah. Oh, really? Uh -huh. My iPad's pretty much worthless. It, it's just not, is not uploading the files and things. Now at, at my PC, it's not been bad, but um, I don't know if it's the weather or I think it's just everybody's on it, doing all the same things. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it contributes to that. I've been impressed though in the last four weeks when we first went online, how seemingly seamless it has been. I have not had any, I mean, real issues. We lost power, you know, uh, last week for an hour or two. 
Oh. And the heavy, strong winds were, were, you know, affecting things. But, but I fully expected with all these people using Zoom and so forth that it was going to overload the system. But um, I read somewhere recently that, that uh, there's plenty of bandwidth, apparently. Uh, at least that's what I, I read. It hasn't been a big issue. See, for me, I'm on a hot spot out here because we haven't hooked up to the high speed yet through Spectrum. Oh, uh -huh. so I I always have a little message across mine that says my bandwidth is low. Oh, interesting. So like I'm just a kind of little bit delayed sometimes. Delayed being uh, just slower or? Yeah. Uh huh. Because when I, when you're talking, it's real time. I don't see any lag. Oh, see when you I talk when I'm listening to you, it's like a little pause. Oh. Uh huh. Interesting. Okay, so do you guys see the PowerPoint in front of you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, um, again, let me just kind of slowly scroll through these. And if, if there's a particular topic that you want to ask about or have questions about, then we can, we can talk about that. Um, Again, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what these slides are kind of indicating. I can I can read this as well as, as, well as you can read it. Um, I think you should be familiar with, with some of these terms that are described in Table 12.3. And uh, some of these you've heard of before, certainly. Um, because the book in this chapter talks a little bit about how some antibiotics are naturally synthesized by fungi, fungi or bacteria, um, but many of the antibiotics we use today have been chemically modified a bit, right? The, the semi-synthetic term we would use to describe that process, as opposed to if we made them solely in the laboratory, which we have for some drugs, um, we'd call those synthetic. Um, this term antimicrobial could mean a lot of things, couldn't it? It could refer to an antibiotic. It could refer to a process, exposure to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the petri plate by UV, by, um, bo you know, boiling can be an antimicrobial process. So again, this is a very, very open-ended sort of term. Uh, so I don't think those should cause you too much problem. This next set of slides talks a little bit about the origin of many antimicrobial drugs, right? As I mentioned a moment ago, most of them uh, are derived from either bacteria or fungi. And there happens to be like these two major genera, not to say that there couldn't be other genera that produce antibiotics. I'm sure there are, but these are the two biggies. Um, and then of course, these next two are referring to fungi. We looked at penicillium in lab like that. I forget what lab it was when we did fun fungi, probably the third lab maybe. And I passed around a petri plate and one of them was penicillium. I think one was aspergillus and I don't recall if there was a third one or not. We looked at oh, rhizopus, which was black bread mold too. So there was at least three plates. But penicillium was one of them. It had sort of a grayish green kind of, um, somewhat, I don't know how you describe it, fuzzy surface, maybe? Yeah, anyway. And so why do bacteria and fungi produce these antibiotics naturally? Well, the second bullet tells you why, right? It's, it's a dog eat dog world out there, not only for you know, humans and other animals, but even microbes. They're sharing similar habitats. They're competing for the same uh, potential food sources, that kind of thing. So it's sort of the uh, survival of the fittest, literally, um, at that population level. And so one way to gain an upper hand over your close cousin, if you're a bacteria, is to kill them, kill it, kill them, right? Inhibit them so that you have more options in terms of places to live, food to eat, that sort of thing. So that's that's sort of the premise behind, you know, why these chemicals have evolved. 
and we've just utilized it to our benefit, really. And it also talks in, interestingly about the historical um, uh, case of how penicillin was discovered by Dr. Fleming back in the late 1920s, and I think he was in London, in England. So there's a whole, uh, you know, making connections box there on uh, 363 that talk about that. Very interesting stuff. So check it out. And then this kind of gets into uh, specific drugs and uh, from what microbe they're derived. Again, um, either a fungus, a mold, or bacteria tend to be the primary sources for most naturally found uh, antimicrobial drugs, antibiotics. And the book goes on to talk about a couple of these specifically, not every single one, but, but quite a few of them. And so you're gonna want to try to connect the name of the drug and its origin. Does it come from a bacterium? Does it come from a fungus? Um, and then the chapter starts going into some things we need to be aware of with respect to how does the antimicrobial work? And we talked a little bit about this on Tuesday, I think. Um, we were talking about how certain antibiotics are designed to kill, say, bacteria or prevent their cell walls from forming in the case of penicillin and its, in its, in its close neighbors, the penicillins, um, basically prevent certain bonds by forming between the, uh, the sugar and the proteins within the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall. So we have nothing to fear from that generally. Now, there can be side effects and, and, and other things that we'll get into a little bit later. But when you take an antibiotic like ampicillin, let's say, which is a cousin of penicillin, the book talks about, you know, when, when terms end in similar derivations like cillins, that means it's a penicillin derived drug. So amoxicillin is derived from the penicillin family. Um, do we have to worry about that penicillin, that ampicillin um, harming our cells? And if not, why not? Anybody? Can you please repeat the question again? When you take ampicillin, when you're prescribed ampicillin, let's say, or amoxicillin for a sore throat, we'll pretend, you're taking it to kill the bacteria that's causing the sore throat, right? Mm -hmm. Do we have to worry about that amoxicillin killing the cells that line our pharynx? No. Or, or the, the cells that line our stomach, because that's where the medicine's going to go eventually, right? Answer is no. And the, and the question is, why not? Well, because, like the slide says, it's like, like it's designed to only kill like bacteria and not like human cells. Or, like, or, like, um, or it's only designed to kill cells that are like infected with bacteria and stuff. Yeah, so, you know, we're talking here about impeding or inhibiting the ability of the cell, in the case of penicillins, impeding their ability to synthesize new cell wall. Now, when would you want to synthesize new cell wall? If you're a bacterial cell and you have a peptidoglycan layer, what, what do you have to fear of this? You already got cell wall, so is this going to hurt you? Well, what do what do bacteria want to do once they get into you? What do, what do any organisms on Earth 
what are they trying to do? <laughs> Reproduce. Exactly. And in the case of bacteria, we're talking cell division, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for a cell to go from one to two and then two to four and four to eight, right? We talked about exponential growth, right? Cells mm -hmm. have to be able to synthesize new peptidoglycan as a parent cell because you will form into two daughter cells. And you can't then do that if penicillin's preventing you from constructing new cell wall. But your cells don't have cell walls, right? Yeah. So the penicillin is not going to affect your cells as they might also divide in a very different process, right? We call it mitosis, cytokinesis, that kind of thing. So this gets, this gets to basic understanding of biology comparing eukaryotic to prokaryotic cell structure, right? Yes. Yeah. And as you will have read shortly, um, some of these antibiotics target protein synthesis, specifically target ribosomes. And we talked about this briefly on Tuesday as well. Because when you look at a eukaryotic ribosome and compare it to a prokaryotic ribosome, you will find that they're different. Well, they're both the assembly sites of proteins. So, you know, from a functional standpoint, they have a similar function. But we're talking about producing drugs or utilizing existing antibiotics that are going to target prokaryotic ribosome function and therefore will not have any deleterious effect on your cell ribosomes because they're constructed differently. Okay. That's not to say that you couldn't have potential allergic reactions or side effects to certain types of antibiotics. But for the most part, bacterial cells and eukaryotic cells that we're made up of are pretty significantly different from one another. Um, this slide is interesting in the sense that it begins to list again the different types of drugs. And this is not talking about where they're derived, okay? This is talking about what cell type is impacted by these drugs. So all of these listed here are going to kill bacteria, and this is how they do that. Some, again, inf influence peptidoglycan formation. Others impact ribosome action or function. Others might prevent DNA replication, right? or RNA synthesis, which is an important part of how proteins get produced. Again, we've talked about all this, so this should be old stuff. This is why I was kind of harping on you guys about you got to know the difference between transcription and translation, right? Because I knew we were going to come to this. I wasn't trying to be mean. Yeah, so um, this is just a really nice table that one can come back to. If you want to get a sense again of what drug targets what kind of microbe and how does that happen. Now do you need to memorize this entire table? No. But as you get into this chapter you will you will be reading about penicillins and cephalosporins and aminoglycosides and you'll be learning about how they directly impact cells. So I would say as I just do a cursory examination of this table um, I'd say roughly half of these drugs you're going to be learning about. And, you sh and as, the, as you go through the PowerPoints, you're going to see those come up as major topics. And, and you will want to know what do they target and how do they kill the bacteria or prevent them from dividing or whatever it might be. Narrow, narrow spectrum, broad spectrum, pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, this was the table I also referenced on Tuesday. Like the preceding table I was mentioning a moment ago, I love this figure because you can always go back to it and get the big picture. Because I'll be honest, and I, and I think you would probably agree, if you started to look at this chapter, it can be a little daunting. It can get kind of confusing. Like, what's this affecting and all that? You know what I'm saying? So just have this maybe handy that you can go back to and reference real quick. And that might help 
keep things sort of in order in your mind as you study these different antimicrobic uh, drugs and exactly how are they impacting the cell. So I think, again, this does a nice job with that. Let me just stop here and see if there are comments, questions. All right, so the first group that we start talking about are those that impact cell wall formation, the penicillins and cephalosporins. And this specifically talks about how that happens, how that impacts cell wall formation. Here we're looking at the effect of penicillin, how it impacts the formation of these linkages that normally exist between the sugars and the phosphates. Because remember, peptidoglycan, think of that word, an important part of the cell wall, be it gram positive or gram negative. Peptido refers to what? Peptides. Right, which are members of the, of the protein, you know, organic compound group. And of course, glycan, what does that refer to? What organic group of molecules? Sugars. Right. So these are sugar and phosphate, or sugar and peptides that are linked together, bonded together to make up this, this structure called peptidoglycan. And so penicillins prevent the formation of these important cross linkages. And therefore you can't, if you're a bacterium and you're subjected to penicillin, you can't make peptidoglycan like you should. And the result is a much weakened cell wall and the cell has nothing to do but to pop or lice because of just how weak the, the membrane or the, the cell wall becomes. So that's basically what this slide talks about. And then we get into a bit of chemistry here with regard to the penicillin family. And um, I think it's important to note that all penicillins share a common nucleus, it's called. Now this is kind of a funny word, um, nucleus, but that's the term they use. It simply means this is the chemical part of the molecule that is common to all penicillins. Now, you see here different kinds of relatives. So when I say penicillins, I'm kind of like including those, even though they're not technically penicillins, but they're, they're close cousins. How are they close cousins? Well, they all share the common nucleus, right? The beta-lactam ring here in red and the thiazolidine ring here in, in yellow. I'm not going to ask you to draw that on a test, but I think you should understand that they have this common nucleus component of the molecule. And by the way, what's at the corners of each of these rings? You don't see it, but do you know what's right here? Those of you that have had chemistry should know. Carbon. Carbon, yeah, there's a carbon up here, and there's a carbon there, right? This is just an abbreviated form of the molecule. So what makes, you know, um, cloxacillin different from carbenicillin is the R group. That's colored here in pink and blue and green and purple. Where else have you heard the term R group? I'm just throw that out for general discussion. Anybody? R groups? Amino acids. Amino acids. There are 20 amino acids. All of them share yeah. an amino group and a carboxyl group or acid group. What makes them different are there are groups. It's the same idea. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Slightly. <laughs> Okay. Here's 
a very similar diagram showing again the uh, beta lactam ring here and the uh, thiazolidine ring. These, of course, are R groups. There are different kinds of penicillins. They mention here G and V. I'm sure there are others as well. But as I mentioned a little bit earlier, all of these other ones end in psyllin, don't they? And so that tells us that they are semi-synthetic derivatives um, we have over the last 100 years now developed R groups in the laboratory that we slap onto the beta-lactam ring and we, and we create a whole new, you know, antibiotic. That's kind of cool. I'd love to know how they do that, you know, at Squibb or Merck or whatever big pharmaceutical company you want to, you know, go to. They're, they're in constant research mode, trying to develop different functional R groups and then testing those to see what effect they have. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, so they talked a little bit about that. They also uh, give you a little sneak preview of how some bacteria can get around penicillin's effect. So let's say you're, you're a penicillin producing fungus and you're trying to kill your, kill your, your neighbor, the bacterium. Well, guess what the bacterium can do to negate the action of your penicillin? That's what this is talking about. This is an enzyme, isn't it? What does it do? Breaks bonds. Did you say responds? Breaks bonds. Breaks bonds. Breaks bonds. What is it? What does it break apart? Penicillin. Penicillin. Yeah, it negates the action of penicillin. So this is an enzyme that some microbes will produce to get around the, the toxin, if you will, the drug that the, other, that the other bacterium is trying to secrete to kill them. Because there are bacteria out there that are resistant to the action of penicillins because they have these enzymes. So and anyway, they talk a little bit about that. You'll hear more about it in later parts of the chapter. There's another uh, group of antibiotics, the cephalosporin group, that again are targeting this, the production of, of uh, cell wall. What makes this different from the penicillin family? has to do with the chemistry. Okay, so here's, here's the common nucleus, which looks a little bit different, doesn't it, from the penicillin, which had the um, beta-lactam ring and the, uh, what's the right term here. Iazolidine ring. Here it's a little bit different ring. That does look quite similar. But what makes this, of course, very different from the penicillins is you have two R groups. Yeah. On, the, on the penicillins, you just had one off to the left side here, if you will, of the diagram. You've got them coming off both rings. So it's a, a different chemistry. These again are preventing peptidoglycan formation by blocking the synthesis of that molecule. Uh, note again, they talk about how many of them have these kef ceph um, prefixes, cephalosporin being, of course, obvious, but there are other terms you run into. So I'm not going to try to pronounce some of these, but that's where they come from. 
And then the text talks about some other cell wall inhibitors that don't possess the beta-lactam ring, which remembers this, this kind of red guy here. So the cephalosporin group and the penicillins have the beta-lactam ring, which is that square red guy. Uh, these particular antibiotics lack that chemical in their structure. And so they introduce vancomycin and bacitracin. And this, of course, talks about the fact that many times you, you use bacitracin, it comes in, an op, uh, in a topical ointment. You have, I'm sure, this in your medicine cabinet, probably, if you go look. Most people have triple antibiotic, antibiotic ointment or neosporin, right? This is just a brand. But if you look closely, it has bacitracin in it. And notice it gets the name from the fact that it's derived from good old Bacillus subtilis. I think we've worked with, with that in lab, haven't we? Yeah, yes, we did. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to just make note here that as we kind of look at the next few dozen slides, whenever you see a term in red that's underlined, if I did that so that you can click on it and hear the pronunciation, because some of these are a little tricky to pronounce, at least they are for me. So uh, click on it and it should take you to a website that'll just say the word, so. And then we move from the cell wall inhibitors to the cell membrane uh, impacting drugs. And there's only just one group here, the polymyxins. And a lot of these are also found in topical ointments. So not only is bacitracin in many of these, but you also find polymyxin. And I've just tried to highlight those in, the, uh, in red there for you. And these polymyxins, the way that they basically kill the, the, the microbe is they impact the permeability of the cell membrane. Uh, in some ways, they act like an emulsifier, you, you know, works like a soap. When you use Dawn dish, wash, dish soap to do your dishes or what have you, um, those act as, sur as surfactants. They're, they're, they're breaking the, the lipids, interfering with lipid formation. And so if we introduce the polymyxin uh, drug, like we're doing here into the cell membrane, uh, it literally ruptures the phospholipid bilayer. And when you do that, you know, the cell just leaks. Out. <coughs> and so what, it, what the chapter basically does is this kind of goes through these five major targeted areas and describes their action. So it's just a matter of kind of going through these and getting comfortable with how the drug works. Keeping in mind that cell wall inhibitors and protein synthesis inhibitors and ribosome impactors make up the majority of anti antibiotics Kind of makes sense. They're the biggest, you know, squares here, aren't they? Of the, of the five. There's a nice table or figure there. I guess it's a figure on page three sixty eight. Sites of inhibition on the prokaryotic ribosome and major antibiotics that act on these sites. What I've done with these next few slides is I've cut in and I, and I pasted how each group impacts the ribosome or the process of transcription or translation. So the little colored triangles in this case are simply showing you how aminoglycosides impact the ribosome. So it talks here about how it causes misreading of the messenger RNA. So again, you, I'm assuming when you see this diagram, you know exactly what that's pointing to. 
what that's referring to. If, if you don't, you need to go back and review that because this will make absolutely no sense. So you see the large and small subunits, obviously in blue. What are these gold things? TRNA. Right, transfer RNA molecules that are going to be transferring in what? Amino acids. Right, right. right. So you, you remember this from one of the earlier chapters, right? And so the aminoglycosides are impacting the 30S subunit here such that the messenger RNA, which is of course this yellow uh, strand that associates with ribosomes, that the tRNA anticodons can read the codon sequences of the messenger RNA. You know, this, this doesn't allow for proper transcription. If you can't transcribe, or I'm sorry, you, if you can't translate the messenger RNA, you can't create the protein. And if you prevent bacteria from making proteins, for example, think of enzymes, right? Enzymes are proteins. They're one type, but they're, that's an important type. Can a cell survive without enzymes? No way. You need enzymes to catalyze both catabolic and anabolic processes, build up and break down, right? So you would stop the cell dead in its tracks. If it can't make protein, it's, it's not going to survive. So that's in essence what these different, these different drugs do. Uh, tetracycline impacting, again, the ribosome by blocking the site for the transfer RNA to fit in. And I think this was the A site. This was the P site. If you can't if you can't bring a transfer RNA in, you're not going to deliver an amino acid. If you can't deliver an amino acid, you're not going to make a protein. So there's numerous ways that these drugs can directly impact translation. No matter how they do that, the cell can't make protein. And so that's what these additional slides talk about. And I think the book did a nice job kind of pointing that out. So I really like that figure 12.5. There, here it is in front of you. It's just, uh, it's got everything all at once, you know. Are there questions on, on this? And then Toward the end of, of this section of the chapter, they talk, of course, about how certain antibiotics can influence metabolism of the microorganism. And they specifically talk about the sulfa drugs or sulfonamides. Maybe you've heard of sulfa drugs. Most all of these are synthetic, so it's man made. And as you again look at the chemistry, which I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate on a test, same idea that whether we're talking about, you know, sulfadiazine or sulfasoxazole or sulfacetamide, what do they all share? The, the nucleus, like the common nucleus, if you will, right? And the differences lie in the R groups, same idea. Slap the orange guy on, you got sulfacetamide. Throw the pink guy on, you got sulfadiazine and so on and so forth. How do sulfa drugs, sulfonamides, how do they impact metabolism? This is really interesting. So this specifically talks about how these two categories of drugs prevent the microorganism from making folic acid, and that's shown here. This tetrahydrofolic acid is the same as folic acid. Has anybody ever heard of folic acid before? Yeah, Maggie, should yeah. you have? Yeah, you all have, okay, great. So, so if a cell wants to make, you know, you know, uh, nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, and even amino acids of different kinds, you have to be able as a cell to create and make folic acid. It's just absolutely critical. Well, what if we could prevent a bacterial cell from doing that? Well, could it replicate its DNA? 
No. Could it make pro proteins potentially if you couldn't make amino acids? No. So this talks about, again, these two categories of drugs, the first of which inhibit an important enzyme in the early stages of this series of reactions that result in the formation of folic acid. And so I'm going to flip to this next slide. You see where it says PABA? Okay, here's, here's PABA. This is the kind of precursor substrate that needs to be converted into this dihydropitoric acid by a, a particular enzyme. So here's the enzyme, we'll call it, the bacterial enzyme in green. Here's the PABA, which stands for what? PABA, what's PABA stand for? It's here somewhere. Anyway, it's, it's about my long term. Normally, PABA fits into the enzyme. The enzyme converts PABA into this. That's the normal sequence, right? Well, now let's introduce sulfonamide drugs. And look what the sulfonamide drug does. Here's, here's the sulfonamide chemistry compared to the PABA. Do they look similar? Yes. Are there differences? Yes. But look what the sulfonamide can do. What's it doing here? Binding to the active site. Right. It's competing, isn't it, with the PABA for the active site of the enzyme. And if you have a higher level of sulfa than you do PABA, <clears throat> it kind of stands to reason that there's going to be more, more sulfonamide fitting into these active sites, thus blocking them from being displaced with the PABA. The result is what? Yeah, you're not producing enough of this. And if we just disregard trimethoprim here for a minute, if we produce less of this, what are we going to produce less of? <laughs> you see where I'm going. Everything right? else. Everything else, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's an important inhibitor, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 competitive inhibit inhibition. We talked about that in one of the earlier chapters as well. Um, and so trimethoprim does very similar thing to the enzyme that's catalyzing this next important reaction that results in the folic acid being made. Again, take sulfonamides out of the equation if you want. Throw tri trimethoprim in. Uh, same basic idea. You're going to be producing much lower folic acid, much less DNA, and so on. But you know what else we could do? We could use both technically or theoretically and enhance the overall inhibition of folic acid as well. Right? Think about it. Yeah. Okay, and then um, we talk in the chapter about some other um, antimicrobial drugs, specifically antifungal, antiprotozoan, antiviral. Okay, we've, we've talked a lot about the antibacterial drugs, but once in a while we run into fungal infections. And how do we treat those? Well, an important group of antifungal drugs are referred to as the macrolide polyene antibiotics. And um, the two that the book talks about are amphotericin B and nystatin. And both of these, for the most part, are impacting the permeability of the, of the cell membrane of the fungus. which we, I think, talked a little bit about earlier in one of the earlier slides. Where was it that I was mentioning that? This one. So this was polymyxin impacting bacterial cell membranes, okay? Same idea of getting into the cell membrane and influencing the permeability. And so these antifungals that I was just mentioning a moment ago um, do something very similar in terms of disrupting the cell membrane of the fungus. And then we get into anti-parasitic chemotherapies. We're talking here about 
antiprotozoan types of drugs. You've heard a lot in recent weeks, if you've been watching the news, about chloroquine's potential use in COVID-19 patients. And um, there's clinical trials being done as we speak to look at the efficiency or effectiveness of chloroquine or, or quinine-based drugs. Um, and you know, I, some patients are really responding well to this. I find it just really, really interesting that we're using a drug that's normally used to fight malaria, for example. I remember we talked about malaria a little bit. That was due to uh, plasmodium, single-celled protist that was transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. Remember this? Yeah. Now there are other tropical diseases too, like um, trypanosoma, right, which is transmitted by a, a fly, causes African sleeping sickness. So there's a whole slug of these different interesting, you know, uh, tropical diseases. But anyway, um, chloroquine has been used for over 100 years to help um, treat malaria, and it's even been used prophylactically. What does that mean? Like you would take it before you would be leaving for a trip to go there. Right, right. <coughs> and I think I probably told you guys many years ago, um, we used to take chloroquine before we would go to Costa Rica and Panama, mostly Panama, because there was a, a couple provinces there that had documented, reported cases of malaria. So we, we took it just to be safe, um, but in recent trips, even that particular province of Panama has not had any reported malarial uh, issues. So I no longer take it prophylactically. And I, I tell the students, you really don't need to take it. It's pretty strong drug. Uh, I have not had any, had any allergic reactions or side effects to it, but my daughter who went with me on the trip about four or five years ago um, did not react well to it. And I, uh, to the point where she, she had dysentery and just did not feel good for a lot of the trip, which was unfortunate. And um, although we can't prove it, I just kind of wonder if the chloroquine, in fact, she was taking um, doxycycline, which is a different kind of drug rather than the chloroquine. And that's even stronger because there are, there are different kinds of antimalarials you can take. But doxycycline is one that I think she ended up taking. And, uh, you know, just kind of kind of really ruined the trip for her to some extent. So, but, but if you travel abroad, especially to the tropics, uh, you need to be aware of these things. And I'm sure, you know, before you go, you check with your physician or go to the CDC website where they list, uh, you know, those sorts of uh, diseases and things you should be aware of. Yellow fever, if you're going to the Amazon and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, Antiprotozoan drugs um, include things like uh, this, metronidazole. If you are um, drinking water straight out of the stream, we talked about Giardia lamblia, remember, a long time ago. This single cell protist causes really bad dysentery, right? Remember us talking about that? Um, Helminth worms. We're talking round worm, tape worm. There are certain types of drugs that one can take if you're diagnosed with a tapeworm or a roundworm infection. And they have different ways of killing the helminth worm. So that's kind of what these talk about. You do not need to know the names of these, by the way. And then we get into antiviral, which is an appropriate topic given, you know, our coronavirus issue. And as it mentions here, one a bit of, well, one downfall from using antiviral drugs is that it's really, really hard not to impact the host cells because as you know, in order for viruses to complete their life cycle, they've got to get into a host cell. If they're outside the cell, are they gonna hurt you? Not generally, no. 
And so when we target viruses, whether it's COVID-19 or the coronavirus, or whether it's AIDS or the virus that causes Ebola or you name it, we want to somehow impact or, or prevent the virus from undergoing its life cycle. In other words, we have to impact the host cell typically in some way, prevent it from getting in, prevent it from replicating inside the cell, prevent it from synthesizing more nucleic acid that it's going to need, prevent it from making proteins that will be used to form capsids to surround the nucleic acid core, prevent it from leaving the cell. So there's different ways you can approach viral um, control, but you've got to understand the biology of the virus, don't you? Because if you understand the biology, then you can understand maybe how to uh, impact the process in some way. So that's what the next few slides start talking about. And they specifically refer, I've picked a couple different antiviral drugs, um, like Tamiflu, maybe you've taken that before, some of you, or Relenza. The key is taking this before you come down with a full-fledged cold or flu. They say take it early on. If you take it later, mid to late infection, it's not going to be very helpful. Well, how does, how does Relenza or Tamiflu work? Well, they talk here about that antiviral drug. And again, there's four of them listed. I'm just focusing on one. So you don't have to worry about these other ones. But I think it's interesting to note how these things work. And, and in the case of Tamiflu or Relenza, as it mentions here, it's preventing the virus from getting released from the host cell. So it gets in no problem. It can replicate its DNA or RNA, I forget, um, um, influenza viruses I think are RNA viruses. But anyway, you, you've got to be able to get more nucleic acid core, right? Whether your DNA or RNA doesn't make any difference. And who does that for you? The host cell? Exactly. The host cell does all the work, right? So this particular set of, of antivirals, as it mentions here, it says stops the action of influenza neuraminidase required for budding and release from the cell. What is neuraminidase? That's one of the proteins on the outside of the envelope. Yeah, exactly right. And it's technically a what? An enzyme. enzyme. It's an enzyme, right. Exactly right. So this is preventing the formation of the virus. The enzyme, the protein, is not allowing the virus to bud out the, the, the cell membrane of the host cell. But it does, it can get in no problem, it can do all the stuff inside, it just can't leave. Well, how does that impact your health? Well, if you can't make more viruses that invade other cells, you're gonna stop the infection in its tracks, aren't you? You can't prevent yourself from getting it, you can't prevent the virus from getting in, you can't prevent nucleic acid replication, you can't prevent protein synthesis, you just don't let it out. You don't let more bad guys out to, go, to infect, infect other cells. So that's kind of what that's talking about. Um, we also review here a little bit about um, retroviruses. We've talked about this before, what the reverse transcriptase enzyme does, which remember is, is coming in with the virus. In this case, we're talking about HIV. It's not the only re um, retrovirus, but it's the one we're more familiar, most familiar with, I think. And um, just to, re to spend a moment reviewing, transcription was what? Describe for me the process. What's transcription? DNA to mRNA. Right. So this is reversing the process. This is taking messenger RNA and synthesizing DNA from that. And then the DNA is going to be used to make protein that you're going to need to encapsulate the RNA if you're an HIV, because this is an enveloped retrovirus. So 
one way to address retrovirus infection like HIV is to prevent the reverse transcriptase enzyme from functioning. And if you've studied anything about HIV or AIDS, you've heard of this drug, azetylthymidine it's called, or AZT for short. This was the primary antiviral drug that was used to treat AIDS patients for a long, long time. We've since come up with a whole host of additional drugs. We talk about a cocktail of drugs that has turned an acute deadly disease. By that, I mean, if you got AIDS in 2020 and by 2030, you were dead. Or maybe I should say 1980, you got it. 1990, you're dead. Today you get it, guess what? It's, it's, a, it's a, a, a treatable. We can, we can get you to 78 or 85 or whatever the average life expectancy is of a human. We, we can treat this quite, quite well now. Keep it in, keep it suppressed. So um, this is talking a little bit about um, a couple of different kinds of antiviral drugs. And we're focusing here on one particular group called the protease inhibitors. And again, the slide kind of talks a little bit about how these protease inhibitors work. Basically, you don't construct the HIV protein the way you need to. This is an enzyme inhibitor. So protease is what the what is normally produced, HIV protease to, to edit and snip the viral proteins into the proper shapes. But with protease inhibitors, these enzymes can't function. They can't snip the the proteins in, in the in the proper way, and so you don't construct the HIV very well. And therefore, a non-functional virus emerges from the host cell. So yes, it emerges, but it's not functional. It, it, the protein code is screwed up. I think this box is important to note as well, which gets back to the idea that you have to understand that viruses are intracellular parasites and that outside the cell, the host cell, they really can't cause major issues. And that's why many of these drugs don't target viruses that are extracellular, meaning outside of the cell. It's mostly affecting, you know, this, the whole cell in some way that we can negate the action of HIV, some aspect of its life cycle. And then it goes on to talk about some naturally produced chemicals. These aren't antibiotics, but they're antimicrobial, or they're actually anti lots of things. You've maybe heard of interferon as it's manufactured by our cells in response to viruses or even to cancer cells. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that HIV or that INV, INF, excuse me, interferons, which is a whole host of chemicals, um, may have a lot uh, of promise in terms of uh, cancer treatment. So we talk a little bit about what interferons do. And then the book kind of shifts gears a bit and talks about drug resistance and how this forms in microorganisms, especially bacteria. And uh, how does a bacterium acquire drug resistance? Well, again, we've talked about these mechanisms before, and there's a video you can watch here that reviews transformation, transduction, conjugation. These are all topics we've talked about. And, uh, and then specifically goes into a, a, a series of mechanisms that bacteria have evolved to negate the action of different drugs. And we talked about penicillinase a few minutes ago, right? That destroys penicillin. That's what's described actually up here. 
but there are other mechanisms that, that microbes have up their sleeve that can allow them to get around the action of different drugs. Very, very interesting. You know, there's a constant battle going on between cells, whether it's between two different bacterial species out in your lawn or um, two different bacterial species uh, in your skin. I mean, you can, you can just go about almost to any habitat um, and, and study this. It's very interesting. So again, I think most of this is pretty straightforward. You shouldn't have any trouble understanding that. And then we get into, uh, well, let me just stop here before I go on. Questions on stuff we've been talking about. Skylar, are you there? See, I often wonder with people, they, they show up and they mute, but I don't know if they're there. So drug res uh, resistance and natural selection, um, this is stuff that actually pertains to what we're getting into in lab. Um, very shortly when we get into um, antibiotic sensitivity testing. This talks about that a little bit and how you assess resistance. So when you look at a, a bunch of different kinds of, a, a given species of bacteria, let's say, in a petri plate, and you subject those bacteria to a particular drug, it's going to kill maybe 95% or 98% of the cells, but there might be a couple colonies here, which you know are derived from a single cell that undergoes binary fission. There might be a couple cells that survive. Well, what allowed those two cells or those two colonies to, to survive but killing all the other ones? Well, it could be any number of things. They circumvented the action of the, of the drug in some way. They utilized maybe one of these mechanisms, right? There's all sorts of ways you can evade a drug action. And so now if you use that same drug, is it effective? No. So when you look at bacteria, colonies of bacteria, there are genetic subtle differences between those colonies. And that could be a, a selective advantage when you subject that group of cells to, a, in this case, a drug couple of these colonies have cells that can survive that. Might kill most of them, but a couple survive. Now, if we continue to use that same drug again and again and again, what's going to happen to drug resistance? It won't be as, yeah, it won't be as effective. Yeah, exactly. The, the drug resistance is going to become a more, more of an issue as time goes on if we continue to use the same drugs again and again and again. So what do we do? Well, sometimes we take them off the shelf. We put them on in storage, literally. We store them. We don't use them for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So why do we do that? Well, because maybe we'll get to a point in time where all the other drugs we've been using, guess what, aren't effective. We pull that guy off the shelf, we use it. Suddenly now, it's much more effective than it was 40 years ago, because the bacteria haven't seen that for 40 years. And so we, we do, we do take certain drugs off the shelf sometimes, out of commission, out of use. We don't throw them out, we keep them, right? Or we, we chemically modify them just a little bit, make them more efficient perhaps um, in killing bacteria. It's interesting. So what are some strategies that 
physicians can use, that drug manufacturers can use to try to limit drug resistance. I think, again, you can read through that. It all, all makes pretty much logical sense. You know, we've all heard when you get a script, finish this, the entire bottle. Don't stop halfway through and hoard the rest for when you get sick. You won't have to go to the doctor. You've got them in the medicine cabinet. You guys never do that, do you? Never. No, never. No, you never do that. Olivia, do you ever do that? I mean, depends. <laughs> hey, you're there. I am here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just muted it because my dog's snoring next to me, and I'm oh, just. I want to hear him. I want to hear him. Turn your turn him up. She's a pug, so she's not that loud, but she's she's next to me snoring. Okay, Maggie, does your dog snore too? Terribly. Really? Yeah. Huh. Is that common for dogs to snore? I guess it must must be, huh? Well, pugs, you know, they don't have a very good nasal passageway to begin with. <laughs> um, and then we get into the fact that some drugs do have side effects. You know, we, we mentioned earlier that even though we might be targeting bacterial cell wall formation or nucleic acid replication or whatever, that doesn't mean that there could sometimes be allergic reactions to certain types of drugs. And you've all you know, heard of this, I'm sure, before. Um, the tetracycline that we made mention of earlier in the uh, lecture, tetracycline is, is um, generally targeting the 30S subunit of the ribosome. But nonetheless, it, is, it, is seems, it appears that um, it does have an adverse effect, especially in young kids here, giving this discoloration of the teeth, which is kind of interesting. I'm not exactly sure why it is doing that, but that has been found to be a bit of a concern in certain young, younger people. Um, amoxicillin can sometimes exhibit uh, side effects. You see skin irritation, skin rash, diarrhea, so forth. That's not uncommon for certain antibiotics to give those sort of reactions in some people. This is really interesting too. It talks about how, and I think we've all probably ex uh, uh, exhibited this or um, had this happen to us, where our normal bacterial flora gets thrown out of whack and something called a super infection can form. Now this could be a yeast infection in the vagina, but we'll use the example here of somebody who has a strep throat, let's say, and we, we prescribe a drug to knock out the streptococcus. Well, little do we know that in our gut, we have you know, helpful, beneficial, normal flora indicated by the, the pink triangles and there are potential pathogens, different strains of E. coli, for example, shown in blue, which are normally kept in check by the residents. But guess what happens when we take the, the uh, streptomy streptomycin or whatever it might be? Oh well, yeah, we get rid of the, the, the sore throat maybe, but what ends up happening also is it's killing a lot of our residents in our gut, which allows these guys that were you know, in check now to reproduce, gain a foothold, and then pretty soon we're dealing with diarrhea and other problems. It's called a super infection. Yeah. So one has to be mindful of these potential side effects that drugs have, antibiotics in particular, in, in influencing other organ systems that might not be anywhere close to where the infection is, you know? And I know this is kind of hard to read, and I don't expect you to memorize this table, but I think it's really interesting to look at some of the side effects of certain types of antimicrobials. Again, these are antibacterial. Here in the first big block, here's a few antifungals. There's not a whole lot of those. Here's the anti-helminth, anti-protozoan drugs, and then antiviral. And you can see some of the different primary side effects. 
which are not insignificant for some people. So how do we choose an antimicrobial drug to minimize side effects, to promote the most efficient action of those drugs? Well, the chapter starts talking about that. It also introduces this use of antibiotic discs that are added to a plate of microorganism. This is that Kirby Bauer procedure. So we'll be um, getting into that actually next week in lab. But in essence, what you're doing is you're growing bacteria on a, on a special type of plate here. It's, it's referred to as Mueller-Hinton agar you use typically. And then you dispense these uh, antibiotic discs onto the, the newly inoculated plate and you incubate those plates, you pull them out. And of course you can see these zones of inhibition around the disc. Now, of course, when we see the clearing, that's telling us that the bacteria aren't able to grow, right? So when you look at these six, six discs, which disc is most effective at inhibiting growth? It's gonna be this guy, isn't it? So we would say that the bacterium is not very resistant to that particular drug as compared to this disc, which has just a small zone of inhibition. In other words, the bacteria were, were able to grow up very close to the disc. Um, this would not be a very effective drug to use if you're trying to treat an infection of that microorganism. So you'll be hearing more about this coming up next week. Um, it's called the Kirby Bauer test, Kirby Bauer method. Really interesting, I wish we could do it, it's really fun. And of course, what I'm pointing to here are two different discs and you can see that both are pretty effective in inhibiting the growth of whatever bacterium this was, a Klebsiella pneumoniae, I guess here, right? But look what happens when you look at their combined action. Right? It's better than either one of them individually, the so-called synergistic in, impact or in effect. So there may, may be times when you want to prescribe more than one antibiotic to a patient because you know, you know, you need to, you need to nip this in the bud like quickly and both of them will, will synergistically work more effectively than if you gave just one or the other drug. So on occasion, not super often, but on occasion, um, two drugs work better than one. And then they talk about some other ways of, of determining drug susceptibility. You can certainly use the Kirby Bauer method, but you can also use other strips like we have here, which is each of these strips is impregnated with uh, a particular antibiotic. So these, these abbreviations IP and TZ stand for the drug, and I don't know what those are. And if you look on the, on the strips themselves, you see different numbers. They're bigger at the top and then the numbers get smaller as you go down the strip. These represent dosages of whatever an antibiotic it is. So the strip actually gives off the drug uh, in ever increasing dosages as you move toward, toward the label, if you will. And you can see how in certain concentrations, it's not effective, is it, at killing the bacteria? So this allows us to determine what's referred to as the minimum inhibitory concentration. The, the, the least amount of drug or the least concentrated form of the drug to inhibit growth of the bacteria. So that's kind of interesting, I think. I've never used these 
um, e-tests, they're called. We should probably look them up sometime, but we've never ordered them. Be fun to see it. Another way of looking at drug susceptibility is to use a series of test tubes, broths really, which are um, basically inoculated with the same uh, amount of bacteria. So you have to be very careful when you set up these tubes, you, you set up the standards such that each tube is given the same amount of bacteria. And then you subject each of these tubes, except for the control, to various concentrations of the drug. So you can see here 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and so on, micrograms of whatever the drug is. And we incubate it, we pull it out, what do you see? What's the minimum inhibitory concentration for that drug? 6.4 microgram. Did you say this one? Yeah. No. Oh. Minimum. Minimum, minimum inhibitory. 1.1 This one. 1. 1.6. Is it hard to read, Vera? No, I guess I was just a letter. <laughs> okay. So this 1.6 microgram concentration is the first tube to be clear, right? Clearing means what? It's no growth, no bacteria. 0.8 and less turbid, right? Growth. Did the drug kill the cells? No. Yeah. So it's just another way of determining the MIC. You can you can use this methodology. You can use the E test. So there's there's different ways of doing it, and here's a another way of, of assessing actually a bunch of different drugs. We have what, two, four, six, eight or so, I think, yeah. Uh, again, I don't know what each of these abbreviations refers to, but it, it is a particular type of antibiotic, except for the top, I guess, so there's seven, this is the control group. And um, the, a machine would, would inoculate all of these wells with a prescribed amount of, of bacteria, in a, in a broth probably, and, and then all of these wells have various concentrations of these different drugs. And so where you see the little X's here is telling us the first dilution where there's no growth. So the pink is growth, the blue is no growth. And so you can determine the, the minimum inhibitory concentration here of multiple drugs all at once, as opposed to if you did one drug with a bunch of test tubes. So the point I'm trying to make is there are different systems out there that allow you to assess a multitude of different drugs simultaneously to try to determine what's the best, most effective concentration to use. Now again, to make the leap from here to you is, 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 is a big leap. This is a little test series of test, uh, you know, wells or tubes. You're a lot bigger than that. You have more volume and fluid, but there are ways of at least getting a sense of um, these concentrations and then they would do further studies on mice and eventually maybe up to humans. So this is a list of several different bacteria which you've come to know and love some of these guys. You've worked with some of them. Um, these are the minimum inhibitory concentrations of uh, five different antibiotics. Again, you don't need to memorize this table, but it's just kind of interesting to note um, that if you want to treat, treat a staphylococcus infection, you'll have to use more penicillin G than you would ampicillin, for example. Um, so, so different drugs have different minimum inhibitory concentrations. And so all of this leads to the formation of marketable drugs after research. And what these researchers basically come up with for each drug is what's called a therapeutic index. It's a value, it's a number. Each drug gets its own therapeutic index or TI. 
the higher the number, the, the, the better it is. Um, because if you have low TI values, it might mean very well that it's, it's the toxicity of the drug may be more of an issue than, than the benefit of using it to kill the bacteria. The concern is always to lessen the toxicity, right? You don't want to be giving somebody something that's going to cause more harm than good. And that's the worry we have now with, with, with people making comments about using chloroquine for, against COVID-19 without doing adequate trials and research. You may end up killing patients. You may end up convincing people to take chloroquine that they should have used to clean their, their aquarium and they take it and they die, <laughs> which happened two weeks ago. Y'all heard about that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Why did they do that? Why would they do that? I don't know. Because somebody gets up and talks about it without knowing what he's talking about. And again, I got to be careful. I want to be too much of a critic, but it just irks me when we don't carefully roll these things out the way we should, because people die as a result. I don't know. And so uh, I'll just wrap up and simply say, make sure you're looking at these case studies and these clinical application, clinical connection boxes that are sprinkled throughout these chapters. I'm sure you've been looking at those. They're, they're pretty interesting. So there you go. There's a quick run through. Questions? Nope. Mary, any questions? Okay. Um, so next week we have let's see. We've got the exam next week, don't we? Is that right already? This month is going to fly by. So we, we have the exam scheduled for next week. Um, I have no problem still meeting on Tuesday and Thursday if you guys want to still do that. And then, you know, maybe we make the exam available on Friday or something like that. Or we could have the exam available on the 23rd and just meet on Tuesday. I'm, I'm okay with, with whatever. Anybody have any opinion? No, I'm okay with whatever. I think either of those options sound good. Okay. Um, well, if you're if you're finding, you know, our meetings helpful, we could we could meet next Thursday, 1 15 to 2.30, and I could free up the exam for Friday. Um, I want to give you enough time to get into chapter 13. I don't want to rush it or abbreviate the time frame for you. So um, why don't we, why don't we plan to um, have the exam available on Friday, April 
24th, right. Um, um, I'm trying to remember what we did. We, we haven't had an online exam here yet, have we? Yeah, we did. Just one. Yeah, we, no, we, we had. Do we do exam two? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I can't remember. I'm, all my classes are getting all muddled in my mind. Oh, yeah. We did. We did. Do you remember what times we did it? Because I just don't recall. Did I have, have it open from like noon to five or nine to three? I think or? it was open during the normal class time. Yeah, it was open during normal class. Yes, they oh. gave us one fifteen to 2.30 to do it. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, let me... I don't know. I, again, I, I can do that. I just, if, if anybody would like to have that extra day, I'm willing to do it on Friday. But if I do it on Friday, let's say from, I don't know, I'm going to pick a time and then somebody's not going to be able to be there. Are there any, are there any time constraints on Friday the 24th for anybody? No. No. I don't have a time constraint. I don't know if I have to work yet on Friday or not. If you do, what time might that be? Do you know? I have no idea. I'm going to go into work literally like in 10 minutes. So I can find out then and then email you if you want. Okay. Uh, anybody else? I have a class from 1230 to 1:30 on Friday. Okay. Mary put in the chat that she has a conflict. Oh, thank you for telling me that. I've been trying to check chat once in a while here. Um, Oh, okay. She has to work until three. But she didn't say like when she starts. Um, seven to three. Okay. Um, well, we could we could have it open from like, like say, you know, two to five or three to five. Would that work? We don't know about Olivia yet. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with anything. That works for me. Yeah, I'm okay with whatever. That works for me too. Mm -hmm. That works for me too. Okay, thank you. Um, so Olivia, you find out today and then you, Email me right away, okay? All righty, we'll do. For the oh. exam, will it be starting from chapter ten, or will there be information from chapter nine on there as well? Um, so just hang on one second. Let me just then reiterate that we're going to shoot for Friday the twenty fourth. Um, maybe have it open from. Um, Uh, what, what do we, why don't we say like four to six? I want to give Mary enough time to get back from work and not have to just feel rushed. Mary, are you still here? We should have audio. Okay. Can you talk or not? Oh, okay. So we could say four to six, we could say like 3.30 to 5.30. Does anybody care? Half an hour is not a big difference, I guess. All right. I I'm gonna, I'm, <coughs> what did you say, Lamont? I said either is fine for me. Okay. All right. I, I'm going to say four to six tentatively. And then if I hear back from Olivia, we might have to adjust that if, if need be, but we'll I'll be in communication with you, but for now, why don't you write down four to six? And then um, back to Julia's question. Um, I'm trying to remember, did we put any of nine on the preceding exam? Yes. Used part of it, didn't we? 
yeah, up to 9.3. So this next exam is supposed to start from 9.4. Yeah, that's what I've got in the book here too. Okay, so um, 9.4 was um, mutations. Yes. Yep, I've got that here. Start with section 9.4. Um, so the rest of that chapter gets into conjugation, transformation, transduction. Some of those very topics we briefly mentioned today in one of those slides, right? As to how bacteria can acquire new genes, some of which might be drug resistant genes. And then um, actually talks about um, HIV, uh, retroviruses, that kind of thing. So this is a, a real good, um, a good thing to, to go back and review. And so a little bit of nine, 10, 11, and 12. We will, we will not put any of 13 on it because we'll have just started that next week. And it's not, I don't think it's fair to hold you responsible for that so, so soon after you're so close to the test date. I have a note that you said no 10.4. Are you still, are we still not covering that? Um, okay, let's go look at that. 10.4, that was the bacterial, that is correct, no 10.4. Okay. And remember, that particular chapter, um, we did not get into quite a bit of what is, is discussed in that first section with regard to the, um, the action of, of restriction uh, endonuclease enzymes. The book, the book goes into quite a bit of detail. Um, it talks about electrophoresis, um, nucleic acid hybridization and probes. We didn't talk about that. You don't have to worry about that. Um, so actually there's a, there's a big chunk of that first section, 10.1, that we did not talk about, Southern blot. So if we didn't talk about it or the slides don't have specific information pertaining to that stuff, don't worry about those sections or those parts of the section, I should say. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we didn't talk about the polymerase chain reaction, which we probably should have. The book goes into quite a bit of detail about that on 306, 307. That's not something you need to worry about. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit in that first section, probably more than 60% that we did not talk about. And then of course, we'll be meeting on Tuesday. So you can always ask more questions if you have other things you want to ask about as well. Okay. Anything else? Comments? Uh, I know this is like a little maybe too early, but I was pleading that all more like asking a favor for like. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. It's not. It's not big. Like the fourth exam, like on the old schedule, it says it's scheduled for the twelfth, for May twelfth. Even though like on the second schedule, it doesn't really say. And I'm just pleading, can you not put it on the tour because that same day I have an EMP exam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we can we can try to work around that. Um, but you do know, Vera, that sometimes you might have like three finals on one day. It happens. And you just gotta suck it up and deal with it. Yeah. I remember when I was in college, I think I had some back to back like chem, chemistry, and then biology or whatever. Um, no, it's nice to spread them out. I, I certainly understand what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of flexibility given the fact that, you know, uh, we're not meeting face to face. And so, yeah, if I can, if I can help you guys and try to minimize other conflicts, you know, uh, Maggie and Julia, you guys let me know too. And then we'll try to do that, certainly. You bet. Thank you.
Thank sure. you. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. I'm meeting with uh, the, one of our deans in, in a half hour to talk about summer, and I'm just wondering what that conversation is going to be like. We're supposed <laughs> to have uh, Micros first summer session. Oh. And uh, uh, I, I don't feel like I can do the lab online. I just don't know how. I mean, you guys tell me, we, you know, I can see where part of you would say, well, hey, it's nice. I'm at home. I don't have to do all the work. I have to manipulate the bacteria. But don't you think it would be like really kind of like unfair to not have lab in person for micro? Yeah. They, they mm -hmm. teach it online. I know they do. It's just like, like lab is supposed to be like hands on. So when you're not like actually doing this stuff physically, then it's no longer like a lab. It's more like lecture. Yeah, I mean, uh, some courses will actually mail you packages for these different labs to do. But um, I don't know. But, I don't have an incubator in my house. Yeah. <laughs> But you don't necessarily really, you know, need it. A lot of these will grow fine at room temperature too. But I think they must mail bacteria, some, you know, non-pathogenic ones out to students to, in a little plastic uh, inoculating loop. And I don't know how you sterile, how you do sterile. Maybe you don't even worry about sterile technique or I don't. Know. I just, I just don't think it's a good thing to do online myself. Play so, with E. coli at the dinner table. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you already got bacteria there, right? Think about yeah, it. Why not? Okay, well, I've taken up a big chunk of your afternoon. You guys um, enjoy your weekend, and um, we'll hear back from Olivia with respect to any potential issues with regard to the time, but we'll shoot for Friday the 24th, 4 to 6. And then, you know, as you're, as you're going through 12, and if you get into 13, um, if something's not making sense or you want to ask about, put a little note on the side margin. Uh, we can certainly do overviews of the chapters like I did today, but then there's not really time for questions so much. But if you guys want to get together at another time, um, I could do that as well. So see how it goes. Sounds good. Okay. Anything else? Nope. No. Okay. Thank you all. I will see you next on Tuesday. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. You're welcome, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.